I begin, I just also wanted to mention, uh, we are now studying the Christian life in our booklet. And uh, we started off by talking about how should we conduct ourselves as, as Christians. That's basically what this section deals with. How do we behave as Christians? What is our conduct? What is our, uh, uh, you know, how we relate with one another? One important aspect of this particular section has been what we call as the dynamics of the Christian life. And last week we studied about how the dynamics of the Christian life translates into these three special aspects. And that is justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification mainly uh, refers to that our relationship with God is restored, of course, in Jesus Christ. Sanctification is the journey we have with Jesus and the Holy Spirit so that we are more and more conformed to him. And glorification, finally, is the completion uh, of our sanctification, which is where we experience life in all its fullness, the Christian life in its fullness. Today, we don't experience that. We have the Christian life, but we continue to struggle, which is going to be the uh, topic for today. Now, what I'm planning to do is I'm hoping from uh, question number nine to probably go to question number 13. Uh, and then I'm going to leave out some of these questions, which probably will be a little bit more, you know, uh, more familiar for all of us. There won't be much discussion in it. So I'm going to plan to leave out a whole lot, except for two questions. One question is, what is the Christian view of marriage? And I thought we will deal with it separately because marriage uh, has you know, become very controversial today. Uh, there are a lot of liberal views. There are a lot of very conservative views, very legalistic views. Maybe we can have a look at it uh, specifically. And another question I'd like to deal with, maybe dedicate one whole Bible study for that is, why should Christians not abuse the natural environment? Environment is now a big topic again. And uh, do we as Christians have a responsibility to protect the environment? So I think we can spend a time, uh, 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 you know, a Bible study in that. Okay, let me then pray and ask for God's blessings. Uh, and we'll begin. Join me as I pray. Uh, loving, gracious Father, Thank you once again that we have this Wednesday evening dedicated to uh, spending time with one another. This is a, a wonderful one hour that we spend, Lord, uh, to discuss and to continue to renew our faith in you, to know more about the scriptures, to go deeper into the scriptures. And for me, it is a pleasure to be able to hear uh, the views of our brethren who have grown in the faith now and have walked in this journey for so long. So we ask for your continued blessings on this time and do uh, open or rather do give us uh, and lead us more into your knowledge because we are hungry for that. We want to know more. So we ask for your blessings upon our time together. We ask it in the name of Jesus, amen. Okay. So we will go ahead and uh, get into question number nine. And Linda is going to share the, uh, the material with us. Once again, we will read the question and the answer, and then we will uh, stop for some discussion. I mean, to say uh, comments that I'd like to make. So the question reads, what is the Christian life like for us now? Okay. And the, and the answer is, in the time period between Jesus' first and second advents, the Christian life is one of growth, of transformation from one degree of glory to another. We are like clay vessels with the glory of Christ shining through. This means that to some degree, we will experience dying with Christ and suffering with him. It will also involve being renewed and restored in faith hope and love. We will not live ideal lives. We will experience grief and sorrow. 
we will experience some opposition, challenges, and possibly even persecution. We will need to repent. We will never reach a plateau of coasting along. It will always involve being deliberate, striving, and being renewed. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we are in a transitional time of growing up, becoming in Christ, and being continually renewed in Christ. All right, so you have a whole lot of uh, uh, thoughts there being introduced to us. And uh, so, Linda, you can stop the sh uh, screen share at this time. So what we can do is let me just make some comments. So the question is, what is the Christian life like now for us? In other words, how are we living it out at this moment? And as you have, as we have read, we are in between the time. That's an interesting phrase that we have used in GCR. Between the times is the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. And uh, the time uh, from the first coming to the second coming, of course, is the critical, crucial thing for us. Those of us who come to faith, we understand what Jesus has done for us. We have accepted that, uh, you know, his uh, love and his invitation to us. But the question is, uh, what is the life we live now? And it's, 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 a, it's a mixed bag, right? Notice it says, we experience uh, sometimes extremes. We experience, like it says, growth. We experience transformation from one degree of glory to another. Uh, in other words, we experience a sense of joy, the joy of salvation. We experience, uh, you know, a great sense of hope and happiness that comes along, knowing that we have, uh, you know, a, uh, we are redeemed and we have salvation in Christ. But on the other hand, the other side of the spectrum, we are also experiencing a dying process and maybe suffering. Uh, and it's an interesting phrase that is mentioned here is, we will not live ideal lives, right? Uh, we just can't, you know, uh, what do you say, experience the ideal, you know, uh, life that we all like to have. Uh, it also says we, we, un, we, we don't reach a plateau of coasting along. And that's a, and I think that's an important phrase for us. And it's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Are you just coasting along? <laughs> um, uh, do you feel, you know, you have plateaued and uh, there is no room for growth? Uh, do you feel you have arrived? <laughs> right? Uh, so these are, you know, questions that probably this, this, uh, uh, this should prompt us to ask, all right? Uh, uh, another word that I'd like to pick up from the answer is, we are in the process of becoming. If you remember last time, was it last time or sometime back, I mentioned about how we belong, we believe, and we become. So we are in that phase, that, that phase of becoming. So it's a growing, transform, transforming process, all right? Let me read to you a scripture, and I'm going to the book of Romans, chapter 8. I'm going to begin to read from verse 35 onwards, and it's very interesting how you see uh, the contrast of, you know, the struggles we face, and but also the sense of hope that we have. Beginning in verse 35, the apostle here says, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written in verse 36, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37 says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through whom 
uh, through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you see that tremendous contrast, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a life where we struggle with affliction, distress, persecution, sometimes, you know, uh, deprivation from various uh, maybe physical things, emotional perspectives. But on the other hand, uh, we are uh, more than conquerors as sheep, you know, or, or rather it says more than conquerors through him who loved us. So we are assured that nothing separates us, though we go through these things. So you have the joy of being in Christ, knowing Christ, becoming in Christ. But on the other hand, we are like sheep, as it says, being sent to the slaughter. So we have this, uh, this very strange contrast. And in this respect, may, my, may I mention that there are certain theologies today, and one in particular is called the prosperity theology, or it is also called the health and wealth gospel, where they say that if you have become a Christian, you necessarily have to be rich. You necessarily have to be healed. Uh, you should not suffer anything. And so we have the pastors and the prop, you know, promulgators of this theology flying around in you know, million dollar jets and uh, Rolls Royce cars. Just today I heard of uh, one particular fellow who uh, has asked the congregation that they have to uh, you know, make sure that he's got, uh, he has to have a jet because he has to fly around and preach. He cannot depend on the commercial airlines. When he was asked, why does he own a Rolls Royce car? Why couldn't he own just, you know, maybe a Buick or whatever Anil is driving? <laughs> Uh, he was, he said, oh, <laughs> he said, this is a gift for my congregation. Man, I thought to myself, I wish my congregation thought like that. <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> I wouldn't take a Rolls Royce car even if the congregation gifted me one. But, you know, uh, that's the deception. Uh, the Christian life has a you know, uh, a spectrum of difficulties we face and all of those things. Now, on the other hand, I also want to make sure that we don't think that just because we are Christians, we got to be, you know, we have to take a vow of poverty. <laughs> you probably heard the vow of poverty, that you have to live a poor life. Now, you have to live a humble life. That doesn't mean to say that you have to have only one meal a day. Now, if you want, want to have one meal a day to reduce your big belly, that's okay. But on the other hand, you don't have to deprive yourself just because, you know, you, you appear like uh, the Pharisees. They throw ash on their head and clothe themselves with sackcloth. We as Christians don't have to go around with sackcloth. So uh, I hope you get the point, but uh, we have that spectrum. Uh, but we are told that we can always be assured that we, that, the love, that we are never separated from the love of God. And we are constantly living a life, hoping that the light of Jesus will shine through us. So that is the Christian life, you know, for us now. Let's go to question 10. And if Linda can help us with the graphic. Uh, All right, the quest, question 10 reads, can we measure or exactly mark our progress in the Christian life? Right, so the question is basically asking, do we know that, you know, uh, we have arrived or we haven't, right? So that's the question basically. And the answer is no, nor is there a need to do so. The Christian life involves a turning away from all that blocks or leads us away from receiving daily God's transforming and healing grace. 
turning towards him in renewed faith, hope, and love. This is true for all, no matter how far along a person is in their journey with Jesus. It's always a matter of turning and facing in the right direction towards Christ and his high calling to walk towards him and with him. All right, so that's the answer. Now, uh, here, uh, there are a few things perhaps it will be good for us to take note of. The basic the question is, can we measure or exactly uh, say that, you know, we are really doing well? Now, it's actually, you know, I hope we can say that I am doing better today than yesterday, right? I am doing better today than five years back or when I started as, you know, my journey in the Christian faith. I hope we can say that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we need to recognize that we are in no position to say that we have arrived, uh, that wow, this is very important. We are in no position to say, and neither should we deceive ourselves into saying that I don't need God's grace today as much as I needed it five years back. Right? Uh, that would be a tragedy. We should, we never ever think that we need God's grace less just because we think we are doing well, we are obeying in a better way, or we understand in a better way, we know more. And this is where I feel that some of the, some of the, you know, Christians or Christian leaders who uh, tend to become very critical of others. They need to be very, very careful that they don't get into an attitude to think that they are doing much better than all this, you know, uh, publicans <laughs> on the side. And that is the unfortunate thing. Uh, and maybe that is what we need to take away from uh, this particular, uh, you know, uh, question. Even though we may have done better, we have progressed. We never think that we need God less. We never think that I need to pray less. I don't have to study less. Well, I can skip church or I don't need church. You know, that is how some people would like to think. Uh, God, <laughs> uh, you know, when we come to faith, we have actually been baptized into a body of believers. And so we never ever try to think or say that, oh, I don't need church anymore. I'm, I'm perfectly all right on my own. Another important point perhaps I would like to point out here is this. Uh, it says, this is true for all, no matter how far along a person is in their journey with Jesus. And this is important. It's always a matter of turning and facing in the right direction towards Christ and his high calling to walk towards him with him. That's a question that perhaps we can ask. Are we facing in the right direction? Some of us may be struggling with all kinds of issues, all kinds of problems, sometimes of our own doing, our own weaknesses, our own shortcomings, sometimes because of circumstances around us, right? But the question we have to always ask is, am I facing in the right direction? And to answer this question, I like to, read you uh, again another passage. I'm going to go to Luke chapter 18. I feel that uh, this, uh, this story that Jesus recites, I think is uh, very telling. And it gives us, uh, you know, it gives us an opportunity to know, am I facing in the right direction? Luke uh, chapter 18, uh, and I'll begin in verse nine. And I'm sure you will uh, know this. Uh, it's actually a parable. Uh, and you are, I'm sure, very familiar with it. But it's worth uh, repeating this. Let me read beginning in verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. I just want to stop there. Notice it says, those who trusted in themselves so if we think that we have arrived, 
if we think that oh you know i don't need god's grace today as much as i needed it sometime back i think we are deceiving ourselves and notice what it what happens when we get into that frame of mind when we start trusting in ourselves in our own righteousness we start looking down on others let me continue to read verse 10 it says two men went up to the temple to pray one a pharisee and the other a tax collector the pharisee standing uh, was standing and praying like this about himself god i thank you that i am not like the other people greedy and righteous adulterers or even like this tax collector i fast twice a week i give a tenth of everything i get but the tax collector standing far off would not even raise his eyes to heaven but kept striking his chest and saying god have mercy on me a sinner and notice the conclusion how jesus christ concludes this parable in verse 14 he says i tell you this one went down to his house justified rather than the other because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted i i i recite this uh, parable because you know i ask the question uh, are we facing the right direction and the and, and the answer to that question is how am i you know uh, how am i praying to god am i praying like the pharisee or the public if i'm praying like the pharisee i'm not looking at jesus where am i looking i'm looking at myself but uh if i am if i am looking at jesus i know how short i am i know how imperfect i am I think Uncle lost his uh, internet. I'll just call him up. As much yeah. as ah, oh, you're back. Uncle, we lost you for some time. No, we we, we lost him again. <laughs> we lost him all together. <laughs> ah, can you hear me? Yes, uncle. Okay. Uh, did you? I, I lost you for a moment. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me. Is that okay if I continue? I hope you can all hear me. Yes. Okay. Let's then. Uh, I think we can stop there with question ten. Let's go to question eleven, Linda. If you can put up the graphic for us. Okay question 11 reads as follows why do we not necessarily make consistent and inevitable prog progress in the christian life and as i was reflecting on this question this uh, i believe this is a very hard question you know if you really look at it uh, there is a uh, there is a, a difficulty in the way we can answer this question why is it that we don't make progress why now why do we still struggle with sin especially when jesus has already uh you know won the battle on the cross and has defeated sin why is it that we still struggle and the answer reads as follows because we live between christ's first and second advents uh we are in a time of transition and so our human natures are still prone to temptation by sin the power of sin sin still at work in the world seeks to pull us away from god toward evil we now have only the down payment or first fruits of the holy spirit and do not yet share fully in the glorified humanity of jesus the fullness of our sharing in jesus christ fully sanctified human nature will occur only after our death or upon his personal return when he will fully manifest his kingdom in a new heaven and a new earth all right so that is the answer given to us as i was mentioning i i i um 
I can understand what is being said there, but I also think that there is a difficulty. And the question is, some people will ask, why is it that if Christ has, you know, overcome sin and he has defeated, you know, sin on the cross, and of course, the author of sin, which is the devil, uh, has been defeated, he's a defeated foe. Why is it that we who have accepted Christ, allowed the Holy, or, uh, uh, you know, have the Holy Spirit residing in us, why is it that we still continue to sin? Um, you know, there is a mystery to that. I, I, I don't think I can fully answer that question. But we, as we look at ourselves, and, uh, and of course, what we look at the scriptures, when you look at the scriptures, we very clearly see that we will continue to struggle with sin. The why aspect is a very difficult question. I mean, if I have the Holy Spirit, why should I struggle with sin? But uh, let us try to see if we can answer that question. Maybe you have some thoughts to share. Uh, later you can do that. But notice it says we are in a time of transition. Like we said earlier, we are living between the times. So what is this living between the times? This is where uh, we do not fully share in the glorified humanity of Jesus. You see, we Jesus has overcome sin, and he has, as he told, uh, you know, as uh, John the Baptist said about Jesus, this is the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. So if he declares that Jesus has taken away the sins of the world, why am I still struggling with it? Why am I still finding sin in my life? So that's a question which is uh, very hard to understand. But then we continue to struggle with sin. You know, in the book of 1 John chapter, that is the epistle of John chapter 1, he very clearly says that if we say we have no sin, we are lying. So in other words, he very clearly indicates that we will continue the struggle with sin. We know that the devil is a defeated foe, but he continues to tempt. He continues to lead us astray. He continues to deceive. Jesus or God has not taken away Satan or the power of Satan to deceive. But thankfully, he's restricted his powers. But, the, but Satan continues to create havoc in the lives of Christians and the lives of those who have come to faith. And on the other hand, we continue to have human natures that struggle, you know, to overcome sin. Uh, our human nature uh, deceives us into sinning. And remember, God has left us with the free choice. He has not taken away our ability to choose. And so in, in our free will, tempted by Satan, and of course, with the weakness of our human nature, that is the unfortunate, what you say, uh, your sort of the mix that creates this difficulty for us between the times. As we live in between the times, we have to struggle with sin. So the question is, all of us struggle with sin one way or the other. Right? It could be sometimes in action, sometimes in thought, sometimes in what we don't do. Uh, all of these things, you know, are uh, sin, sin. And of course, we discussed about sin some time back. The question is, are we still forgiven? Are we still living in a forgiven state? Or are we separated every time we sin? And that's the, perhaps the crucial question we need to ask. Or are the answer? The answer to that is yes. We continue to be forgiven, right? Uh, and of course, we have a responsibility to confess. It's not that God uh, forgives us only when we confess. When we confess, we are being truthful to ourselves. We are acknowledging that we are struggling with sin, but God's forgiveness is is absolutely automatic. Why am, I, why am I so confident in saying that? It's because what Jesus himself told Peter when Peter asked, uh, 
Jesus. How many times shall I forgive my neighbor, you know, uh, if he sins? Should I do it seven times? And then the eighth time I take my gun and put a bullet through his head? <laughs> what did Jesus say? No, but 70 times seven. And we know that it is he is not trying to teach Peter mathematics here. He's basically saying you need to be in a forgiving attitude all the time. Now, if he expects of us to be forgiving all the time, then how much more is he forgiving? How much more is he willing to extend his grace to us? So, yes, the reality of str the struggle with sin is real. There is no doubts about it. But we are forgiven. What I must say one thing, one very important thing I'd like to say. Though we struggle with sin, what we need to realize is that sin cannot destroy us forever. Why? Because Jesus has destroyed the effect of sin, you know, in its finality. Jesus on the cross has defeated the, or have taken the penalty of sin and has defeated the effect of sin once and for all. So, even though we struggle with sinfulness, we can be absolutely certain that, that those sins will not destroy us forever. As long as we come under the blood of Jesus, as long as we continue to retain our faith in Jesus, because it is his righteousness that we finally need. It is his life that we finally need. And, in, and those of you who may have reflected on the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus this past week, we know that the crucifixion uh, made sure that the body of sin is put to death. So our bodies represented in Christ's humanity has been put to death. So in other words, we have entered the death of Jesus, but Jesus didn't remain dead. He was resurrected. So we can also rise with him. So we don't have to fear death. Because in Christ we have life. And we can live in him who is life. Don't forget Jesus said I am the way, the truth and what? The life. So in him we have life. But once again going back to our question. Today, as we live as human, you know, in between the times, we continue to struggle with sin. But at least we know that we remain forgiven. Uh, and it is our responsibility to confess because we need to be truthful and acknowledge that we are sinful. But we can live in the hope that this, these sins will not take away our life for all eternity. Because in Christ, we are protected. We are saved we are you know absolutely safe in the salvation that jesus has given to us okay we are coming to the last two questions for today uh question number 12 and uh, i'll just read the question and i really um i won't read the answer because this is something that we have you know uh, uh, probably studied many a times. The question reads, how do we resist temptation to pull away from God? How do we fight temptation? How do we overcome, in other words? Right? And of course, we have various ways, uh, and I leave it for you to read that answer. Uh, just suffice it for me to say that no matter what, whatever temptation we find, how much, how many times ever we are tempted, how many times ever we fall, uh, my my submission is that we should never give up on the mercy of God. We should never give up on the grace of God because God's grace is much greater than our sin. And we continue to come back to him and we know we are safe in him. Uh, no matter how much, how strong the temptation or how many times we give in to temptation, never give up on Jesus. Let's go to question 13 then. And the question reads, why should Christians obey God? And I'll stop with this. And of course, this seems like a very obvious question. But I think there is uh, something that we need to understand here. Uh, the answer reads, not to win God's love, for God already loves us. Not to earn salvation, for Jesus 
Christ has already earned it for us. Not to avoid punishment, for then we would obey out of fear. Rather, with gladness of heart, we obey God out of gratitude for his freely given grace and mercy. We obey by faith in him and in all he has done, is doing, and will yet do for us to the glory of God. All right, so uh, that's the answer. Let us let me just give you, make a few comments, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. So uh, why should we obey, uh, why should Christians obey God? And this, I think the answer to this really uh, probably, you know, distinguishes the Christian perspective from most other, almost or all other, you know, uh, religious beliefs and faiths that exist. Most will say you have to obey because you, you have to earn God's favor. In other words, most other, uh, you know, belief systems look at obedience as a transaction. It is transactional. I, if I do this, then I will get that. But that is what Christianity is, does not preach and does not teach. It very clearly says we obey not to win God's love because you cannot make God love you more just by obedience. Remember, God is love. He can never stop being love. His very essence is love. Everything he does is out of love and for love and in love. So our obedience will not make any difference to his love. He continues to love us. And of course, like I said earlier, it is obviously not to earn salvation because we cannot earn salvation, right? Jesus has done it for us. So it's not a transaction with God. So the question is, why do we obey God? You know, and, and, and in the simplest way, I will put it like this. If you are a child of God, you will, you will behave like a child of God, right? Uh, if you are a child of God, you will do everything to manifest that you are a child of God. And obviously, you will do everything to reflect the light of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, right? Uh, Obviously, we are, we are not going to live like a child of the devil. <laughs> then if we do, we have actually rejected Jesus. We have rejected God. We have rejected being uh, a, you know, a child of God. And that will be unfortunate, you know, to, to take the message a little bit more closer. You know, I belong to the Zachariah family. And everything I do, I would try to my best to uphold the name of the Zachariah family, right? Uh, I will not act like, you know, as though I belong to some other or I don't belong to the Zachariah family. So if I belong to the family of God, then I will do everything to uphold the value system of that family. And that's why I obey God, not to earn God's love, not to earn his salvation, not to avoid punishment because Jesus has taken away the punishment from us, for us, right? So what we have to realize is Christianity is not performance-based. We do not have a review system where we are, we are given points. Okay, you know, you have, you have done uh, you know, an average job and so, uh, uh, so, you know, your salvation will be downgraded. Uh, no, there is no downgrading in the family of God. Right? Uh, I keep thinking about the parable of the prodigal son. Right? How did the father treat both the sons? One son, you know, walked away, and yet the father treated him as, you know, a beloved son. The other son tried to think that he could earn the father's favor by being obedient. But the father told him, you have to do all of that. You are still my son. <laughs> right. So uh, perhaps we can end on that note. Uh, we got uh, 15 minutes as I look at my talk there uh, for some discussion.
So let's stop there. And like I said earlier, I won't go through all the other questions. I'm yet to debate whether I will take up those two questions that I mentioned, one on the Christian view of marriage and the other one on the environment. Maybe if I have time, we will, we will uh, take up those two and then complete uh, this particular section. So let me open it up for some discussion. Any thoughts that you might have? Uh, especially with what I had asked you to think about. Why is it that we continue to sin even though we are, you know, uh, sin has been removed and defeated? Uh, maybe if you have any thoughts to add to that from what I've already said, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I didn't see any hands going up as yet. Uh, but yes, Anil, go ahead. Yes. Well, um, talking about uh, sin, why we continue to sin. One of the reasons God has placed us on this earth is uh, to develop character, to have a righteous character. And how will we develop character unless there is something to push against? And that's probably one of the things that sin still exists so that we are conscious, uh, consciously fighting and developing character in us. That's my thoughts. Okay. Yes, Anil. I, I mean, I, I, I agree because the Bible says we are going from faith to faith. Our faith is being strengthened. Uh, so, yes, there is a, uh, what do you say? A becoming, you know, that is probably the becoming aspect. We are becoming more like Christ. So, yes, absolutely true. But then, you know, the, on the other hand, there are people who might not have opportunity, you know, to uh, have enough time on the earth to develop that character. Like some people might die young. Mm -hmm. uh, what about them, you know, and then uh, are they going to miss out on building on character? So these are questions that sometimes can be a little uh, problematic. Yeah. Yes, uh, Bertram, go ahead. Uh, it, it could be uh, uh, because we are not fully aware of God's standard of righteousness or maybe uh, the lack of prayer or lack of study, uh, maybe under duress or maybe, you know, uh, just negligent of God's righteousness. There is a standard. God says I will in Proverbs, I will teach you and instruct you in the way you should go. I will guide you by my eye. But sometimes, you, uh, you know, that righteousness uh, possibly we, uh, which we need to recognize and live by, uh, we fall short of it. And uh, hence, because we are ignorant and uh, because whether consciously or unconsciously, we do not do that righteousness, it could cause uh, our struggle with sin. Uh Thank you, Bertie. Yes, uh, I think I, I, I like that first part uh, of your comment uh, where you said that sometimes uh, we are ignorant of God's way or God's righteousness, if you like. Uh, we are constantly being informed of God's standards and we are understanding and learning more as the days go by. And so, yes, so there are gaps in our understanding. And that's one of the reasons why we should never try to judge others, uh, because some people may be at a level which is not uh, the same as others. And uh, so, yes, so there, it's a constant growth process. Yeah, that's, thanks for your comments. Yeah. Anybody else would like to add any thoughts to that? <clears throat> on a, yes, Anil, go ahead. No, on a separate one, the question about can we measure or exactly mark our progress in the Christian life, the answer here is categorically no. But I don't think that's quite correct because, I mean, as we, uh, especially as a new Christian, as we grow in the word, we are actually progressing in the spiritual life. To, the, to that extent, we can say that, yeah, we can measure our progress 
not that uh, you know we claim that we have arrived as you said but at least we we can certainly say like if i look back 10 years from uh, you know uh, 10 years ago and what and now i can definitely say that we have progressed in our christian walk okay. yes anil i think uh, uh, you have a good point there there's no doubts about that that uh you know deep inside of our hearts we might know that i've been able to overcome certain things and yes but maybe the answer uh being no here a categorical no maybe is a way for for um you know uh to reinforce in us to never ever be complacent right right um uh, for example we can never go before god and declare to him uh, god you know i mean i've lived uh, 30 years yeah. you know and uh, when i began 30 years back i was a dirty rotten scoundrel but i am much better today so uh, <laughs> uh you know i mean in in the eyes of god that that just doesn't uh, cut the mustard you know i mean i remember someone telling me a, a, a you know a, relating a story about how somebody you know uh, who thought he was a good christian he dies and uh, and he lived a long life and uh, he appears before uh, early gates you know of course remember this is just a, a story and uh, and then he comes and peter saint peter is there to greet him and uh, uh and then he asked saint peter hey um uh, am i allowed in <laughs> right and uh, peter says well it depends uh, and then he says well you know uh well i how many points do i need to get in and peter looks at him and says well let's say 100 points <laughs> okay then, uh, you know how many how many points would you give to me uh you know be just because i i uh you know lived a good life or at least i tried to live a good life for 30 years and peter says one point <laughs> one point and then he sees somebody else who appears at the pearly gates and he just walks in <laughs> and asks peter what well, you know may i go in and <laughs> Peter says how come that guy just walked in and you're telling me 100 points and peter looks at him and says see what you need to know is we don't play this game here <laughs> you can walk in right god doesn't require points because he <laughs> done it for you you know maybe uh, i don't know if that story helps but uh, i just wanted to say that because uh, uh we never try to you know play points with god all we do is lord i am a sinner thank you for saving me that's all correct right. okay uh any any question on the obedience yes bertram go ahead uh we we say we are called and we are the elect and uh, we are our, our lives in christ uh, the forgiveness we come under the blood of christ we have the life of christ we are in transition we are growing and we are turning to the lord and you know may, and you know uh, dependent on the lord but what if the person is not called and we uh, we assume he is called and he is uh, really not called uh, uh, am i crossing the judgmental line and uh, assuming that that uh, because i'm not knowing uh, i was sometimes i would wonder i'm just saying hypothetical uh, uh, why uh, that person may not be called the hence he is not having the spirit of god uh, to you know strengthen him to help him to turn and to live a uh, life in resurrection you know to live a life of overcoming with christ in him uh, I, i hope i have not jumbled the question my point is uh we look at that person and uh, assume that he is not called because uh like he uh, not not christ like sort of so, so to speak 
would I, I suppose that would cross the judgmental line, I think. Okay, I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly, but maybe you are uh, trying to say, when you look at someone who's supposedly a Christian, but lives like a rat bag, you know, <laughs> uh, are you saying that I should, I should still not judge him that he is, uh, you know, uh, he needs to know that he's living like a rat bag? I mean, is that what you're trying to say, Bertie? That yeah, uh, yeah, because uh, I suppose we are we are we consider him as one of the number of us. Okay, because it's not somebody whom we know that he's not a Christian. Uh, we know he is a Christian. We okay. know, that, yeah, he is with us. One of the well, number. Well, you know, I mean, the Apostle Paul very clearly pulled people up for living a life contrary to the Christian way. Uh, he was very categorical in naming, you know, sins of people. Uh, Jesus Christ did it. He called out the hypocrisy of uh, the Pharisees, right? So uh, when something is very obvious, I mean, for a, a church, uh, you know, a church or uh, uh, the leadership of the church cannot be completely, you know, turn a blind eye to it. In fact, that would not be love, showing love. You need to help the person. So you try to come from the position of trying to help, not judge. So you don't judge the person, but you try to help the person. And I think that would make some difference. Does that make sense, Bertie? Yes, very much. Okay. Anybody else want to throw some light on that? Our elder is sitting there uh, <laughs> quite comfortable. Franklin, please help us out with, with your wisdom also. <laughs> <laughs> he only wants to wave his hands. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few, uh, maybe, maybe just a few minutes left. Any other thoughts? I was just also wanting if you had any thought on this uh, why should we obey uh, and we are, we're not doing it? You know, uh, it's not a transaction with God. Does that make sense? Any, any thoughts on that? Because lots of Christians struggle with this. You know, uh, they keep feeling that they will have to do penance. I hear of Christians saying, I have to fast because only then God will forgive me. Uh, some people, you know, have to do a pilgrimage because they feel they can they can sort of increase their points. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I think we need to realize we, when we obey, we are behaving like God's children. That's all. We are not trying to win points or score points with God. Any any thoughts on that? Any any confusion on that? Because. This, this differentiates Christianity from most other faiths because every other faith is only transactional. Uh, and if I can say Christianity is, a, is relational, it's a relationship, it's not a transaction right, with God. Okay, well, uh, if uh, there are no more questions, we can... Uh, wind up for today. Well, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to see you all. And I think, uh, uh, like I said, it is, uh, you know, I look forward to Wednesday evenings because we have such an opportunity to talk and discuss and, and just spend this time with each other. And of course, in the direction of the Holy Spirit. Since our elder has said nothing, maybe he can at least offer a prayer. That's Would you please do the honors, uh, Franklin? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Gracious Lord, our loving Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to meet on this virtual platform. Lord, thank you, Father, for helping us, Father, to come and to study your word afresh. Lord, we want to thank you, Father, for your continuing grace, giving us, Lord, the honesty and the courage to look at a subject afresh every time. Lord, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for being working in our individual lives, in our families, and in our corporate life. Lord, to be a Christian is really tough. 
Lord, we thank you for your grace, and for your mercies. Thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord, for our pastor who comes faithfully and teaches us. We thank you, Lord, for all our members who join us here. And we also remember those who could not join us. Lord, we pray that you will touch our hearts, Father, and we will receive your words deep down. And we will, Father, we will learn to obey you willingly and joyfully. Fill our hearts, Lord, with your love so that we grow in your love and we manifest that love, Lord, towards our fellow human beings. Lord, be with us as we depart and we meet the following week. Thank you, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.